Hello, everybody. Today is January 10th, and we're going to be discussing the next generation of the Catalog Source API. With that, I'm going to hand the meeting over to Bryce. Yep. Thanks, Alex. Um, so, I'm going to kick off this meeting with just a quick prototype um, of a back end component that would be used. Um, th this would be like a replacement for the gRPC. Um, server that's currently run with, with OPM when you run OPM serve. Um, and we're testing to see what it would be like to serve a file-based catalog via GraphQL. Um, and so this is just a little prototype of it. Um, and I'll go ahead and run this command. So you see it's just like serving with OPM. Um, I just have it built to a custom binary. So we can see it does the same thing that OPM does. It'll pull down this image, build the cache, and then it'll go ahead and serve it. But this time, instead of a gRPC API, it is a GraphQL API. Um, so if I pull this open, we can see that we have uh, a, just using the GraphQL playgrounds because it's easier, but we can formulate a GraphQL query. And so this qu particular query here will fetch the entire catalog contents. Um, and in case anyone didn't catch the catalog that I'm using, I'm using just the latest community operators catalog. Um, and so when we fetch the entire catalog, it'll take a second and then we'll get all the packages, all the bundles, all the channels um, and any other metadata or like any other um, information that's in the catalog that's not like a package bundle or a channel. Um, and so that was fetching the entire catalog. Um, using GraphQL, you can also, uh, you know, narrow it down from instead of just fetching the entire catalog, we can fetch the all the catalog con contents for a particular package name. Um, so in this case, we're going to do the CC operator. And so we can fetch that and we can get all the packages for the CC operator. We can get all the bundles for the CC operator, and then get all the channels, and then all the metadata, which it doesn't have any. Uh, and then say we're another client that doesn't want to fetch all the catalog contents or even all the catalog contents per particular operator. It just wants to know what operators are available in this catalog. Uh, so we can go ahead and we can use this graph, this simple GraphQL query to get the names of every single package in the catalog. So we can see these are all the operators that can be installed uh, in the catalog. Um, and we just get a simple package name response. Um, and then say we know what operator we want to install, but we want to see what channels are available for us to install from. Um, we can go ahead and execute that query and we can see that the API operator has the channel 2.x-stable and stable. Um, and say now I've decided I want to install this particular bundle in the 2.x-stable channel of the API operator. Um, but I want to see what kind of stuff is in that bundle first. Um, I can go ahead and run this query, and I can get just the bundle information for that particular bundle. Um, so I see all the properties, the object, and related images. Um, and yeah, that's for the most part, the, the simplest kind of demonstration I can give of the GraphQL queries. Um, one thing I can show here is if somebody wanted to see the default channel as well, um, they could do that. And then we can see the default channel for all the different packages. Um, but Graph, GraphQL, you can kind of configure the query language to be, you know, send whatever request and um, the API can return, you know, whatever you've requested. Um, and so this kind of format allows us to put more on the client, you know, making sure that they ask for exactly the data they need and we'll return them that information. Um, it makes it so that we have to do less work on the API side, make less changes in the API if a client wants, you know, to be able to narrow focus in on particular things. We don't have to go create a new endpoint specifically for allowing them to get a particular package or something like that. They can just, you know, 
narrow this down to be uh, querying exactly for what they want. But yeah. um, go ahead and I don't know if I can keep my screen shared if people have any questions or want me to test anything. Um, but yeah, other than that, that's the demo. Um, and then I figured we could kind of go from this and kind of, um, Anik, I don't know if you want to discuss kind of your um, design doc um, or if we want to talk about how this GraphQL API could potentially be used in the next generation catalog source API or however we want, however we want this to go. Yeah, so there, I think there are some questions that, I mean, leads from this GraphQL demonstration into the questions that, into the discussions that's being talked in the design doc, but I think it's better to kind of pause to see if anybody else has any thoughts before we go into those discussions, if that makes sense. Yeah, I have a quick question. Thank you, Anik, and thank you for the demo, Bryce. The first question I, well, it's not so much a question and as much of a request. Um, it might, since this is going to be recording up and loaded to YouTube, it might be good to preface that like the, the purpose of this video is to discuss the observability into the catalog contents, correct? We're not considering like performance implications or any improvements in that regard. Um, I mean, correct. The, the goal is for visibility um, and making it so that way, you know, different clients can request different things and they don't have to. Um, you know, it, the GraphQL will make it so that a client can request whatever they want from, you know, this these catalog contents, and we should be able to return that to them. Um, this inherently kind of has some performance benefit because, I mean, if you're fetching the entire catalog, I mean, we see that that takes like a significant amount of time versus if I was just fetching all the package names, it's significantly faster. Um, so, I mean, with GraphQL, kind of like how much data you're requesting will impact kind of the response time and the size of the response. Um, but that's kind of like a given with GraphQL in general. I mean, the more the more data you request, the longer it takes for you to get it. Um, but right. And then, but, but one the, follow but, yeah, the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I thought you were done. Please continue. Yeah, I was just saying, but yeah, the, the overall goal isn't necessarily specifically for performance reasons that we're doing this. Right, right. Yeah, I was just trying to cut up the problem because I know we, uh, <laughs> the next generation catalog source API, you know, is going to, uh, uh, th there's a lot of conversations that we're having in that space, right, in terms of how the image is built, and this just focuses on the observability aspect, and that's all I wanted to confirm. Yep. But I think what uh, I would say is that if we're going to choose any path, it has to be at least as performant as what we currently have, right? Like we're not going to regress and say, oh, well, you, you you have to use this much CPU and this much memory and this much bandwidth if, if it's going to be more than what our current gRPC API is. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I would. So just to preface everything, I was focusing on the, we had discussed using OCI images and I just want to make sure that like that was a completely separate discussion, right? Like not OCI images, the, uh, um, we, I believe okay. it was image references. OCI artifacts. Yeah. That's, that's an, that, 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 that's the discussion about how the images are stored are shipped in registries. This is the part that comes after the, Images after you have the images available, and then how do you deliver this content on cluster for clients to consume? Yeah, so, so, okay. So, so but just to clarify, there on the OCI artifact side, the idea is that clients can talk directly to the image registries, and we wouldn't even need a server at all. Um, so part of part of the larger discussion is that like we're we're trying to come up with a new API in OLMV one um, that clusters can use to understand how to look at the contents of catalogs. And one of the problems we have now is that our catalog source API, depending on how it's used and the way that it's most prevalently used is that it starts up a pod and then runs a server in that pod. So that server, so there's a few implications there. One is we have to make sure that that pod is actually something that can be scheduled on the cluster. We've run into problems with that with 
PSA, right? Like older versions of images and older versions of pods can't be scheduled in certain circumstances if uh, restricted PSA is enforcement is enabled. Um, we have to have this backwards compatibility thought process where any any catalog source image that has ever worked has to continue working. Um, so that, that the implication is like is pretty wide ranging, right? Because you've got uh, the, the first problem of like, can I even schedule the pod? And then there's the follow on problem of like, once the pod is running, can I connect to it in the same way that I've always connected to it? Um, so you've got a bunch of implications there. If, if we can get rid of that whole pod concept, then, um, then we sort of solve some of those problems. This particular conversation doesn't get around that. Like this particular conversation is just focused on, well, if we can't, just have OCI artifacts, then is there a better server than the gRPC API that we currently serve? Uh, so that that's what this prototype is about. Got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so that was the piece of information that I was missing. So thank you, Joe. Uh, I was I was curious how this played into that and your your description makes it clear that we're not considering this with that. It's in lieu of. So, so in my mind here, I, I think like the, the reason we're thinking about GraphQL is because we have multiple persona, like multiple client personas, right? You've got Depi, which cares about properties and constraints and bundles, and you've got the console or a CLI that or basically essentially a human user that wants to inspect the contents and what they what they care about is potentially different it might not be different um and so what graphql does is it enables us to have essentially just one entry point into the catalog and then it lets clients decide how they want to query it so uh it it simplifies the maintenance on the server side because you know, as long as we implement all of the endpoints, then clients have a lot of flexibility. We don't have to go and, um, you know, have a brand new API endpoint that adds one more field to the output if if we add another field to our output. So there's a lot of benefits to, to something like this, I think. Um, but it doesn't solve the pod scheduling problem. Like, that's a separate problem. Yeah, so so what you just said, Joe, I think it leads to a discussion that I wanted to have uh, as the, the pre on the that's on the top of the priority list, which is um, like if you've read the doc where it talks about the pod scheduling problem, and then it, we've been thinking about ways to get around the pod scheduling problem. Um, one was a custom server API uh, suggestion, but then I think that uh, is a little restrictive and also kind of has other implications that probably needs to be sorted out <clears throat> before, um, yeah, we can probably, I think I have the link to the doc. Um, it should be in the email and then, um, right, thank you for that, Bryce. Um, yeah, so while Bryce searches for that, I was saying that, this this particular um, prototype, Joe, I think one of the questions that you have, and you also mentioned before is, do we even need a server on, on cluster, uh, which is a pod? Um, instead, clients can reach out to the registry directly. Um, I think I have questions around that. Uh, I think in the brain dump doc that you have internally, you also had this um, question that do we even need a pod to serve this. Um, but then I think that gets into the, so the whole reason that there is, there was, or there is in the current system, a pod that serves the content on cluster is that it is built on the, is built on the statement that it is cheaper to have um, some memory and uh, CPU consumption on cluster to deliver this content um, to clients rather than have clients reach out to image registries every time it needs the content. Um, so from that perspective, I think we need some way for this content to be cached on cluster and then 
have this content deliver every time a client asks for it and combine that with the you know the registry polling logic that we have um so if every time th there's like a 45 minute 60 minute whatever the, a custom interval where the images are refreshed um or the content of, of the you know registry is refreshed on in the cache on cluster and then that content is delivered to uh, to the clients on cluster does that does that make sense uh potentially um i think in my mind if we build the if if, if we there's a bunch of ifs here and i don't really want to go down this route because i feel like uh, like we should probably do a separate discussion about oci artifacts but um if we have oci artifacts i we can probably build it in such a way that it's very low cost to go and hit the registry when things change um I think I have a few things in my demo that's like, okay, check if the root package changed. If it did, then go fetch its thing. And there's like this recursive, like only actually get things that change. So if you add like a single entry to a channel, like the actual amount of stuff that you have to fetch is like, you know, a couple hundred bytes or something. So I, I think there's some optimization that we get automatically by using OCR artifacts. But the question of, um, you know, maybe we still need to run a server. If, if we don't have artifacts, yes, we have to run a server somewhere, somehow. The question, I think, is that the hard part to answer is how do we actually get that catalog FBC data onto the cluster in some way? And the only way we have of um, correctly pulling the right image is to use a pod because the only thing that knows how to pull that image correctly is um, is cryo, which is backed by Kubelet. And the only way that Kubelet knows how to do that is to basically reconcile a pod and start it and run it. So if we if there's another way to do that, which there isn't right now, then that would be another option, right? Like Ben and I, Ben Fries and I have been kind of throwing like around how do we how do we have a more um, general workload centric way of mounting container image file systems. Essentially, that's what we're trying to do here. If there's a way to do that, that doesn't require us to depend on a binary running in each of those file systems, then we have a much better um, way forward. Because then OLM controls the pod spec we just have to mount all of the catalog FBCs into that pod that we want, and then we can read it from there. That pod spec can change. The underlying server can change. Like, that doesn't matter. The only interface that we would expect catalog images to have at that point would just be FBC, and then we would go and extract the FBC out of it. Unfortunately, Cryo doesn't have a way of letting you do volume mounts of image of container images. So that's Unless we go and change the CRI and do a whole bunch of stuff, that's also sort of a dead end. Yeah. So I've been. I mean, I've I had a crazy thought. I don't know how viable this is or how um, how wild of a thought this is. But then, at least if you think about OCI artifacts um, or OCI images containing these artifacts, that's that's being pulled. You're right that uh, the pulling of these images. Um, it's a very low cost optimized kind of option right but then these images are still there and then they need to be sort of unpacked for example for if we end up using graphql um uh then it still has for example bryce's prototype is uh, serving this from a directory um like he talks about a cache that today's opm server has similar kind of cache so that content needs to be mounted in a file system right um and then joe you talked about all of the problems around how the, it's not possible unless we have a pod running. Um, I was thinking we need a way. So we need a controller, for example, to have the catalog source CRD so that users have a way of mentioning the um, the catalog source um, or, or the image repo repositories, or as we say in today's world, index images. Um, and then the controller itself, that is a pod. So we could have a, a, that kind of exposes you know health checks and all of the other ports we could have another port over there um that 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 is exposed from the same pod that exposes the content of all of the clusters on catalog and that kind of falls into the 
uh, the OLM V1, everything is cluster scoped uh, architecture too, because now we don't have to think about namespace scope. Any catalog source that's created on cluster is um, the content is available. If you have a service from that controller, from that, uh, yeah, the controller part, then you can just query that service to get the content. Um, maybe that's a way of getting around, you know, creating and managing pods ourselves and getting the PS and the scheduling problems because then this controller is part of the master workload. So it's by default going to be whatever all the master workload is following, right? Does that make sense or did I just blabber without making much sense? So I, I, I think these are good things to discuss, but I'm just, I, I think I might've opened up a can of words, worms and I'm curious if there's specific questions regarding the GraphQL solution that we wanna discuss um, before diving into the different approaches for the OCI artifacts question. Oh, I just have a very quick one, if that's all right. Uh, yep. I was wondering whether you guys also modeled uh, the dependencies in, the database so you could just say you know give me all the dependencies for this particular bundle you mean like um dependencies isn't like this this bundle requires foo operator right um i don't i mean if that's kind of in the catalog by default then it should be present because um, it's pretty much doing the exact same thing as OPM, just serving everything via GraphQL. But I can reshare my screen and see, I try to find. The quick answer there is FBC, the current version of FBC puts those requirements in properties. There's not a separate dependencies field in FBC. I think that's probably something we should think about changing, but at least as of today, um, there are bundles that have like property type olm.package.required. And then something is expected to know that that actually should be interpreted as a constraint. Gotcha. So if that's the case, then um, the way that the properties are set up in the GraphQL API is it's just um, an interface, uh, like a regular Go interface. So it can be anything as long as it, um, so like the type is a string and then the value can be an interface. So as long as it follows this parameter of what a property is, if that property exists, it would show up in, in the properties list of a bundle. Um, so like Joe's saying, if it, if you have that type where you have the olm.package.required and something needs to resolve it like that, it it will show up. Okay, but it doesn't actually set up any kind of connections between the bundles when you load in the database. Mm, so that you could yeah. sort of very quickly pull out um, all of the sort of you know required um, packages or um required gbks that yeah you know, I, all the bundles that fulfill those requirements I, I think the answer that i would have for that is no because at the fbc level there is no concept of specific constraint implementations it's just a bunch of opaque properties and even if we had a separate constraint type I think at that point it's just a bunch of opaque property no, no. constraints. From from the FBC perspective, it makes total sense. I was just wondering if in within the database itself, you know, we try to um, understand those requirements because you know uh, these setting up dependencies or the dependency graph, uh, my guess would be maps really well into uh, GraphQL. 
I guess the I guess the question is like which components do we want to have to change if if there's something that changes with respect to constraint implementations, right? Like if if all of a sudden tomorrow we say like oh there's a new constraint type called olim dot you know package dot required dot v two then we've got to go change Depi, and we also then have to change this, and we have to make sure that any cluster that wants to use that, like it's updated in both places. So I think one of the things that at least I've realized dealing with this is that the backwards compatibility promise we've currently set up with catalogs is really limiting, and it makes it really hard for us to add new features. And if we can centralize all of the logic about like what catalogs contain and what they mean into one place, then, and then I think that place is probably on cluster. Then, like, then we don't have to worry about the compatibility of the binaries that are serving these catalogs. Like, I would rather us be able to cut these binaries out entirely. And this, I think, is pretty close because it basically just says, like, we're just going to give you everything that's in the FBC, but we'll give you a nice ish way to query it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think if we have just a, a single server, let's say that we own, um, and then the catalog sources just become, you know, ways for some um, operator to load that data into um, the server, then that should hopefully solve that. And then all the repository uh, registries can just be, you know, just shipping FBC and that's it. Yeah, like another, another, maybe another example of what I'm sort of thinking about is like, you could also just have, like we could treat the catalogs a lot like we treat the bundles right now where we just think of them as a pile of FBC and we could on cluster, like load it, like basically do an init container, copy the FPC into our container, and then run our own server that essentially maybe is like an Nginx server that just serves the entire contents of whatever's in the FPC directory, right? Like I'm sort of thinking about like, what is the easiest way for us to avoid having the contain the catalog image itself defining its server? Like the, yeah. and, and so maybe another way to look at this is, what actually is the API? Like right now with FBC, there's two APIs. There's FBC and there's gRPC. And you have to get both of them sort of right. What I would like to say is like, okay, actually there's just one API. And if that API is FBC, then how do we get that FBC into Depi such that it knows about it or into the um, console such that it knows about it? And then the extensibility piece of it is improved because then you could say, okay, well, there's no intermediate, there's no intermediary thing we have to update. If we add a new field to the FBC, we just have to go and update our clients to know about that new field directly. So there's kind of just like, just updates for that one API rather than plumbing it through gRPC and, you know, along the path. So, so this is interesting because I, I guess I'm, I was sitting here in this meeting and I was kind of questioning the, the, the value proposition of using uh, gRPC here at all. Like I, I, I kind of agree, like I kind of think that something that literally just file serves the FBC by itself gets you about the same value proposition because to me, it seems like the only, the only statement we've made in favor of gRPC is the flexibility of the query engine. But if that's the only thing we're getting out of it, like, do we really imagine that there's gonna be lots of folks who are gonna be interacting with this separate API directly rather than interacting with the FBC as an API? And if we do, then maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't know. We 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 did the same thing with the gRPC server in the first place, right? There, all, we basically built we chose gRPC specifically because we thought that there's going to be a lot of folks who are going to be asking for lots of subsets of this kind of data, and we want those requests to be fast and not have to dump a whole bunch of data all at the same time. 
and that never really happened, right? Like the OpenShift console doesn't query gRPC. It just asks the package server questions. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess I, the way I see it, uh, unless there's some other really strong value prop for gRPC or for, sorry, for GraphQL, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit lost at the, at the value here. I guess in my mind, like if we if we have GraphQL, then it's conceivable that you don't even need a package server. Um, so I guess part of my thought process is how can we reduce on cluster cache? Like right now, we've got, as far as I know, like a pretty large chunk of the catalog copied in three different places on the cluster. One is on disk in the catalog image itself. Another is in the cache of the catalog operator and another is in the cache of the package server. So part of what I'm thinking is like, is there a way to reduce the amount of memory that we use such that, um, you know, make, if, if, if queries are really fast, like maybe we can have like a really small cache and only, you know, we'd still cache stuff maybe, but maybe we wouldn't cache everything. We would just cache the response from a query for you know two minutes or something and then if someone asks again two minutes later it's like okay great let's go back and ask the the original server again so i'm thinking of that kind of thing too maybe that's you know maybe that's a little bit too far in that direction but that's sort of part of the thought process that i had i, I guess know. so it, it just uh, in, in in my mind like realistically i don't, I don't think that they're gonna they're gonna be a lot of consumers who are going to ask for you know, oh, I just want the related image set for this one bundle in this package. Like when when we what we see is the OpenShift console uses the 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 um, the package server because that gets it all of the UI metadata all in one dump, and it's rendering all that stuff on the same page at the same time. But that's not. I mean, that's not true, right? The the package there is no view in the console that shows the entire catalog. It, the 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 raw view of the operator hub definitely does this right like they list all the packages up front right all, the, all the packages but like there's different views of the catalog where like okay this view gives you a list of all the packages and this other view for a package gives you the list of channels and maybe you may, maybe some metadata about that package an icon the description of the package and then maybe there's another view, which is like, here's the view of a particular bundle. But in general, like, I can imagine that like a user clicking through those views, probably 99% of the catalog is irrelevant because you don't care about if there's a hundred packages, maybe a particular cluster only ever cares about 10 of them. And so you never have to even query for the other 90 of them or whatever. That, that that might that might be true, but like even then, like you're the the maybe the console needs something that can give me all the metadata about all the UI bits for a particular package. I, I I guess like that's a separate thing, right? Like you could you could imagine an implementation of an API that exposes that as an endpoint. Um, but I I I don't I don't know that there are very specific use cases for things other than that like what like the I, there's a lot of flexibility here but i don't know that like i don't know that it's necessary yeah i'll also say that the cache itself that joe mentioned i don't think it's been a problem for for example the console or depi that caches all of this data um i was talking to ben larry actually he mentioned that um he we were checking this and then um the other day and it turns out that it's hardly for all three catalogs together, um, it doesn't go above two or three megs because I don't think even current Depi caches all of the metadata that you can get from uh, list bundle, for example. Uh, the cache thing is only a problem for the, had become a problem when the FBC was being served um, in, in the registry pods. So that's probably something to keep in mind too when we're talking about optimizing cache copies. Right, but even in that case, uh, 
the catalog operator is still asking for the entire contents of all the list bundles. So while it might while it might not be caching it, you're still getting the bandwidth cost. And there's also um, well another optimization which which I don't know if we've implemented, which is, uh, hey registry pod, here's the last here's the digest of the last time I queried for list bundles. Has it changed? If no, then you know I don't need to list them again. So I think there's I mean I I, I think we're way off topic at this point, but I think there's like a bunch of little optimizations like that that can make a lot of this a lot more snappy and, and a lot more performant. Um, and again, like this is all like, it doesn't really matter what the underlying protocols are. It's just um, some things that we can potentially do to limit the amount of stuff that we basically limit CPU bandwidth and memory. Um, and I agree, like, it seems like the focus is primarily on the actual usage of the registry pods themselves. Um, so maybe that should be where the focus of this conversation is too. But it honestly concerns me a little bit that Depi, well, maybe that doesn't matter that much. I was going to say that like the catalog operator even further filters down the stuff that it caches, but that's, that's probably fine. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd also say that the other thing that you mentioned about um, package server and console. So at least for the package server, the queries that Kevin mentioned, um, we have to at least, in in the interest of not regressing, make sure that our users can query the same amount of it, same information. Um, and even if you talk about using a plugin, again, this is probably getting way off topic. But at least if you're using GraphQL, so there has to be a way for um, providing the same information to the users through a plugin. Um, and, and and then for the console too, it sounds like they're porting over. They they have an entire system that is um, querying packets so package manifest. But now we are porting over. We are we'll be asking them to port over to a different system that does the same thing, but the underlying technology is different. So it it's a lot of work to do the same thing when they could be not doing the same thing and getting the same results. Uh, so th that's probably another thought that I had, but again, this is probably getting off topic from what the demo is about, and we are already over by 10 minutes, so. Well, I mean, I think that's somewhat on topic because we're talking GraphQL. It, in my mind, there's nothing that precludes us from continuing to run a package server if that's what we need, but then it gives us flexibility to change what package server asks for without having to go and change the API, right? So like, um, well, that's not a good example, I guess. I was just gonna say that there was a change that we made recently um, where we added the channel entries to what the package server sees. To do that, I was able to make use of the existing gRPC API, but I had to list all the bundles which is pretty heavy, right? Of course, like as I'm listing the bundles, I can filter out and not look at everything, uh, and not actually cache everything. But if there was a GraphQL API that just had all the list of channels, then it would it would have been a little bit simpler. And there was no gRPC API that told me, here's the channels and all the entries in the channel, right? So if, if I wanted to build something even more performant, I would have had to go and add a new gRPC endpoint Create a new OPM server binary, and then hope that all of the other that all of those catalog images out there went and started using that binary. Um, so again, I, I think we're retreading some of the past conversation, but there's a lot of different places that we can optimize here, um, and I think it it might actually be worthwhile to kind of write down like, okay, what are the what are all the different problems that we're trying to solve and then focus the conversations on each of those problems? Because I think there's probably like three or four major topics for those things. One is the pod scheduling. One is the running a server provided by the image. Um, and one is the optimization of resources on the cluster. I think those are like the three main ones that I can think of. Uh, and I mean, I'd also include um getting the content to um, clients on cluster 
uh, that all of the optimization that we already did, like saving caches and stuff. Um, so it seems like at least for V0, uh, while we are designing or implementing that, that was a major kind of uh, talking point about how to how to get this to clients on cluster quickly. So maybe that's also one of the points included. Um, so first of all, a big plus one to Joe's comment about let's make sure we've defined all the problems we're trying to solve because otherwise we tend to circle around as we solve one problem and then somebody brings up the other problem and then we go focus on that one. Um, the other thing though, as we talk about the package server, I was thinking about this, you know, this GraphQL is cool, but this is a ultimately a Kubernetes component. And as a user of it, I would expect to have a Kubernetes API interface to understand the state of the system, right? That's the APIs I'm interacting with when I'm installing these things, the operators themselves and looking at their status, I would kind of expect to be able to get API resources that tell me what operators exist to be installed. So whether that's the package server wrapping GraphQL, the package server wrapping gRPC, the package server directly <laughs> serving content from FBC. Uh, if it is moving away from the package server entirely and moving to a CRD model or, or something else. Or, um, but I think it's important to keep in, in mind, um, well, it's, it's a discussion point, but whether how important is it to have a native Kubernetes API for this catalog content. Um, and assuming that it is important, that obviously has, has big implications for how we move forward. Because if you're gonna have that anyway, then that may address whether it makes sense to have other interfaces that aren't that or not. Yeah, so, so this was, I think, one of the points I was trying to make too. Because if you think about the origination of the packet, ser packet server, um, we already had the registry pods that you could list bundles, um, uh, that you could query the list bundle API from. But then I think the packet server was, um, it was sort of born out of the request that, hey, this is Kubernetes. I, I want a Kubernetes native way of knowing what packages are there. Um, so packet server is basically a wrapper around um, list bundle that makes the, the response from list bundle more Kubernetes native. So I think we probably want to make sure that we don't lose the context of why the packet server is existing in the first place. Um, and I think that's what exactly Ben was trying to say too. Yeah, I would also plus one that, um, and I think I've seen some of Daniel's um, kind of OLMV1 requirements that I don't know if they directly say there has to be a Kubernetes API, but it seems like there's at least a strong implication that um, there's a Kubernetes API to look at package data. So I, I've always imagined that there will still be some sort of package server equivalent in OLMV1. Okay. Maybe, maybe okay. So, so maybe the next step over here is to just sort of, um, I don't know if anybody's taking um, notes, but at least it's recorded. So ask the, I mean, write down the questions and um, probably worth then looking into if if um, having a custom API server is not a problem, then, then maybe see if we can answer some of those questions through a package server, um, V1, I guess. I would say that it's not a problem because we're still doing it now and no one has told us explicitly you must get rid of it. So I think it's reasonable to assume that we can keep doing that. Okay. So I, I yeah, I, I think I've gotten everything that I wanted from this discussion, Bryce. I don't know if you have any uh, or anybody else have any other afterthought, last one questions? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think this was a great discussion. Um, I'm, I've am i been mostly quiet all of this because I'm, there's a lot of um, context that was going around that because I wasn't 
a part of the original catalog source stuff and don't have as much experience in that. Um, still wrapping my head around and processing, but um, yeah, I, I think there's overall great discussion and, and was good use of time for sure. One area, I know we don't, we don't need to talk about this now, but one area that I'm interested in probing a little bit more is with um, how Depi would actually consume this and like what, like, is there a, we've talked about like a cluster catalog source API and we've also talked about Depi source API. So I think an area that would be important to talk about fairly soon is like, okay, what would, what would the architecture diagram look like if we wanted Depi as it's currently built to talk to this GraphQL thing, for example, as it's currently built? Like, what would we put in place? And then if, if you said, okay, well, GraphQL goes away, now it's OCI artifacts, what would we do then? If it's the existing gRPC um, API, what would we do then? And is there some sort of abstraction that makes it easy for us to do any, any of those three if we wanted to. Um, and if we have something like that, then I think it'd be a lot easier for us to start iterating and experimenting and plugging things in and plug, pulling things out and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, and ideally the thing that Depi will query will also be the thing that other clients query. And I'm not saying registry pods intentionally. So just something that replaces registry pods, but it's a common sort of component that's been queried by all of the clients. So we don't have to uh, sort of customize this component for each and every client. Yeah, and maybe to expand, well, I, I think we should schedule another discussion about that maybe because they can, that's like a whole new thing that could take another 30 minutes. Okay, yeah, so so I can um, take some of the questions. The design dog, I think, talks about these problems a lot uh, already, but I think I can just formalize the questions that we talked about right now and then schedule another call for that. Sounds good. Thanks, Anik. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.